The premise of cryogenics is simple. Freeze a person's body upon death, then thaw them out once the cure for whatever killed them has been discovered. It could be cancer, an infectious disease, or in the case of one C. Montgomery Burns, 17 stab wounds to the back. <laughs> On the surface, that makes a lot of sense, but to many, the logic behind it is only surface. Among mainstream scientists, cryogenics is viewed at best as pseudoscience and at worst as outright quackery. Challenging the views of mainstream science isn't inherently bad. It just requires a higher level of evidentiary proof, a standard that is rarely met. So is cryogenics the next germ theory or is it the next phrenology? Let's find out. History. The first experiments using cryopreservation on human cells began in 1954, but we're going to circle back to those experiments I late. I see an app called History. You'll need to get that from the App Store first. <laughs> Speaking of science of science fiction, where is my Star Trek-like computer rather than this shit? Why are you even listening to me, Siri, you freak? But we'll circle back to those experiments later. It wasn't until April of 1966 that the first full human body was frozen. This early attempt was destined to fail because the woman in question had already been dead and embalmed for two months before being frozen. <laughs> It's not going to work out. They're not going to be able to thaw her up. Embalming is bad for you. Embalming fluid is formaldehyde. It's extremely poisonous. And it should be clear from the outset that this attempt was just going to be a non-starter. The woman was thawed out and buried by relatives shortly after being frozen. However, this may have just been an attempt to see what would happen to the cells of a human body when frozen, rather than a genuine effort to preserve the woman for a later revival, something that would have been objectively impossible in her state. The first body frozen with the intent of being thawed and brought to life was that of psychology professor James Bedford. Now, one of the people responsible for this historic event was Robert Nelson. Robert was incredibly fascinated with the field of cryogenics, and after joining the Cryonic Society of California, he was quickly voted in as president. For those that would want to argue against cryonics being quackery, this uh, was a poorly thought out vote. Perhaps none of the society's members knew it at the time, but Robert wasn't a scientist. He hadn't even graduated high school. He was just a TV <laughs> It was just a TV repairman that thought cryonics was interesting and got in way over his head. Bodies were frozen and sent to him, forcing him to store them in boxes laced with styrofoam and filled with dry ice. And he did this all in his friend's garage. He really hadn't thought it through. Eventually, he rented a vault to store the bodies in, but money quickly dried up. The upfront fees for freezing a person weren't extraordinarily high, and it turned out random strangers or even family members didn't want to offer up money to keep dead bodies frozen in the hopes that someday they'd come back to life. The money dried up, and Robert locked the vault and walked away leaving nine bodies to thaw and decompose. James Bedford, who is still being preserved today, remains the only person frozen before 1974 who has not been thawed. Once word of what happened broke, the families of the frozen subjects sued Nelson and won a total of $800,000. Robert changed his name and disappeared, though he re-emerged in the 2010s to write his autobiography. <laughs> Jesus, that's a story. Freezing people is not easy. I would love to say that despite the rocky start, things have turned around. And well, to some degree they have. Rather than just a handful of people stored in a garage, there are now roughly 500 people cryogenically frozen worldwide, with the vast majority of these being in the United States. In some cases, it is only the brain that is frozen rather than the entire body, perhaps in the hope that the brain can be thawed and their consciousness uploaded into a machine or put into a new body. However, with no plans to thaw anyone out and indeed with no idea how to even do it, it's hard to say that it's turned around much. The Science as the title of Robert's book may indicate, freezing people is indeed not easy. To start, the person needs to be already dead. Because it is largely regarded as fringe pseudoscience, particularly from a legal standpoint, death is a requirement. Performing the procedure on a living person would have serious ethical and legal implications. It could also definitely be called murder. But after they are dead, a person can choose to have their remains handled as they wish. At least sometimes they can. In many countries, the practice is outright illegal, and the the only acceptable method for dealing with a person's remains are burial, cremation, and donating to science. Like real science, not cryogenic science. Once the person has died, it's important to act quickly. Decomposition begins immediately, and the brain decomposes faster than the rest of the body. The process can sometimes begin oh, within minutes of death, minimizing any amount of decomposition that may take place. From there, it's just a simple matter of freezing the body safely. And if you have any idea to how to do that, well, we'd love to hear it, because the companies that do this freezing, <laughs> they haven't figured it out yet either. One of the main problems with freezing a human body is that we're about 60% water. When water freezes, it turns into ice crystals. When ice crystals form 
form within your cells, they rupture the cell membranes, damaging them irreparably. The original technique to try and avoid this was known as slow programmable freezing, in which the body was slowly frozen over several hours to try and prevent these ice crystals from forming. In the mid-1980s, a new technique was developed that improved upon this. Rather than freezing the body as slowly as possible, scientists went the complete opposite direction and decided to freeze it as fast as possible using a process known as vitrification. This flash freezing process involves cryoprotectant substances used to protect biological tissue from freezing damage. These exist in nature in certain Arctic and Antarctic animals, so it seems like a natural course of action. In high enough concentrations, cryoprotectants can stop the formation of ice crystals completely. With the hope of being able to store transplantable organs for later use, the first cryoprotectants that allowed for vitrification at slow coolant rates were developed in the 1990s. These solutions were also tested on animal brains, which were frozen and then thawed, and there was absolutely no damage resulting from the ice crystals. Truly, this was science at its best. Except for the fact that there was severe cellular damage resulting from dehydration and from how highly toxic the cryoprotectants are. This is the same issue that would arise in humans once thawed. Even if a better solution is found, every single person currently frozen is already going to be damaged beyond repair. The brain and its neural circuits are simply too damaged from vitrification, even if the cells weren't torn open by ice crystals. The economics. Critics claim that it is highly unlikely any of the companies offering cryogenic services will exist by the time thawing out and reanimating a person becomes a possibility. Other critics claim that it will never be a possibility, so it's all a moot point anyway. However, since all of the early companies that offered this service went bankrupt, changes have been made to try and prevent such a thing from happening in the future. As Robert Nelson learned, living relatives aren't exactly keen on paying annual fees for the preservation of their already dead relatives. Those payments quickly dried up, resulting in the bodies thawing out. The solution is to get as much money as possible at the time the services are rendered. The cost for cryogenic freezing ranges from $28,000 to $200,000, and the money is typically taken from a life insurance policy. In addition, those wanting to reserve this service must pay an annual fee ranging from $120 to $700 per year. This means that as long as there are more people that want to be frozen, there will always be a steady influx of cash. And let's just say that that description sounds absolutely nothing like a Ponzi scheme for legal reasons and we'll move on from there. In the short term, this is sustainable, especially with one of the cryogenics companies, Alcor, purportedly having a fund of over $10 million to keep their customers frozen. The technology is still relatively new, and so few people have had the opportunity to be frozen that there is still a bit of a novelty, mystique, and naive hope revolving around cryogenics. However, how long can this realistically last for? 50 years? 200? How long will companies be able to support keeping these dead bodies frozen as it becomes more and more clear that they will never be revived. Unless through some absolute miracle someone actually figures out how to thaw out and revive a dead body, public interest in these companies is eventually going to wane. And there's going to be a lot of thawed out corpses that need burying pronto. Successful Cryopreservation Fortunately, it's not all doom and gloom. Remember when we said the first use of cryopreservation on human cells was in 1954? It was performed on sperm cells, and these sperm cells were thawed and used to inseminate three women. Using cryogenics on thin samples or individual cells is much easier than on an entire body or even just a single organ because the samples can be frozen much faster and thus require a much lower dose of the highly toxic cryoprotectants. Slow programmable freezing was the predominant form of preserving eggs and sperm cells for decades, though since the development of vitrification, a massive shift has been made. The first successful live birth using an egg cell frozen with vitrification was achieved in 1999, and as the sample size increased, it has shown to be four times more effective than slow freezing at producing a clinical pregnancy. Since sperm are a renewable resource, men who choose to have their sperm frozen typically only do so before undergoing a vasectomy or chemotherapy, though some also will as a result of advanced age or a decline in the quality and quantity of sperm production. For Women, the reasons for freezing eggs are much more varied. Whatever their reason may be, research has shown that eggs frozen by age 35 have a higher likelihood of achieving a clinical pregnancy than unfrozen eggs extracted for in vitro fertilization at a later age. Results were even better for eggs frozen at age 25, but this isn't always possible due to cost. For men, the process is simple. All they have to do is fire around into a cup and they're done. The freezing process costs $1,000 or less, and the annual storage fee is under $300. Women, on the other hand, have a much 
more complicated process. Though egg collection is considered a minor surgical procedure, generally taking about 15 minutes and being performed simply with a needle rather than actually cutting the patient open, it's still a surgical procedure. And surgery means cost to the tune of around five to twelve thousand dollars. There's also another four thousand to five thousand dollars in fertility medications beforehand. Once that's all done, the storage fees are compatible to those of sperm, but that's still a huge upfront cost. Cryogenics may not have been used to bring anybody back from the dead, but by using the same technology with sperm and egg cells, there are literally thousands of people walking around right now who would have never been born without cryogenics. There's also possibly a couple of hundred that can't yet walk and are just crying and pooping their pants. Wrap up. So, the year is 2450, and despite all the odds, you have been successfully thawed from your cryogenic storage facility and revived. You were 87 years old when you died in the hospital bed of natural causes. You felt the world fading away, and for the next 400 years, there was nothing. Suddenly, your brain was reactivated as your body sprang back to life. You again awake up in a hospital bed, disorientated at first, but feeling fine. The doctors try to explain to you what's happening, but you can't understand what anyone's saying. English is a dead language now, with Luxembourgish having taken on as the universal standard. <laughs> you lift yourself out of the bed, you wander out of the room, making your way to the main entrance. You gaze out as flying cars speed through the sky and children chase each other on hoverboards. Yes! A man bumps your shoulder by accident as he rushes to work, followed by his two metallic android servants. Every science fiction fantasy you've ever had seems to have become a reality, but it's too much to take in. You feel your chest tight and your arm goes numb from the terrifying shock of the world you've awoken to. You collapse to the ground, having only experienced a few moments of a future society, and the world fades away best 200 grand I ever spent. Now that may all sound a bit dramatic, but well, don't worry about it because it's never going to fucking happen. Cryogenics as a means to freeze and then revive an entire human being is an absolute pipe dream. It can't be performed until you're dead. And once you are, the process damages your body beyond repair. We should all just accept the fact that we're going to die someday and get on with our lives rather than endlessly pursuing the boring, torturous drudgery that would be immortality. I don't know, I find it all pessimistic. <laughs> I want to be frozen. Come on. Thanks for watching.